Today the title of the message is I Give Up. And um, the purpose is to draw a subtle but critically uh, distinct difference between the two words, submission and surrender. Submission and surrender. Um, I, I, I uh, am big on words and their meanings. I, I believe that uh, you've often heard me say that uh, one of the enemy's ploys, one of the devil's tricks is to try to uh, change words. Uh, if he can't change the definition of word, what he'll try to do is blur the definition of word. It's a trick that goes all the way back to the garden. When Eve's faith was compromised in the beginning, it started with the serpent asking her, hath God said? And he used uh, words to try to compromise her faith. And uh, so I believe that it's very important that we uh, pay close attention to the words we hear, the words we embrace, the words we believe. Um, because if I can uh, get you to question a word, or if I can get the definition blurred, then what happens is you blur the, 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 the clarity. Where it's perfectly clear. And then if I can blur the clarity of something, then I all of a sudden blur its purpose. And so we are in a war today in our society, and it's a, it's a war of words, and we have people even trying to uh, change design. Because if they can change design, they can change uh, purpose. And assault design, you assault creation, or the creator. And ultimately, the war we're seeing today in our society is having trouble defining what a woman is or what a man is. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that's an assault on God, the creator. If you have a picture and it's a nice picture, we can talk all day about it and what you think you see in the picture and what you think it means. But at the end of the day, that picture points to an artist. And that artist, his, his existence is revealed by the portrait. And creation is a, a, a testament to God's existence, amen. So today I want, I want us to talk about surrender versus submission. It's a very subtle difference. In fact, some of our dictionaries will have them as synonyms and they will mean the same thing. But there is a difference in there. The word submit means to yield to the will or the authority of another. When I was employed at uh, USAA and when I was employed at Frost National Bank, the moment I signed in, the moment I punched in, I yielded my will to the authority of another. How many of you do that when you go to work tomorrow? As soon as you punch in, as soon as you sign in, you yield your will to another. And um, I didn't have to understand it, I didn't have to agree with it, I didn't have to like it, but if I wanted to keep my job, I just had to do it. The, the word submit means to subject yourself to a condition or a process. On the other hand, we define the word surrender as to relinquish possession or control of something to another because of demand or compulsion. To give up in favor of another, especially voluntary, to give up or to abandon. Submission has an implication of tolerance, while the word surrender has an implication of abandonment. So parenthetically, uh, it's important to see these words because their de definitions bring clarity to where we stand. Because today there are a lot of people that are submitted to God in more than one area of their life. A lot of people, they submit themselves to their tithing or to the church attendance or to service to God. There's a lot of submission in the house of God, but at the end of the day, there is not a lot of people that are totally surrendered to God. It's a lot easier for me to submit a Sunday to God than it is to surrender the entire week to God. It's a lot easier for me to give him some money, a portion of my money, than it is to give him all that I have. It's easier to submit certain things that I do instead of surrender all that I am to God. And I believe that the desire and the hunger that we have to see more of God is to give more of ourselves. Today, we're going to look at a verse that we've seen many times before. It's the story we've so often gone over in Mark chapter 10 where a man was interested in 
submission. And he wanted to know what he could do to be in compliance. But he ended up walking away sad because he was challenged with surrender. It's the story of the rich young ruler found in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. This relatively young man comes to Jesus to ask him a question. Now, right off the bat, we understand three things about this young man and three things that are going on for him. Number one, he was rich. In, Luke, in Luke's account of the story of this ruler, the Greek word plus, pliosos is used, which is a Greek word that means wealth pertaining to or having an abundance or having earthly possessions that exceeds the normal expectancy. And in the passage is described as great wealth. And that word great is sphodora. And it indicates a very high point on a scale of extent. For Bill Gates, sphodora indicates extreme. It was as if a Bill Gates or a Elon Musk was coming up to Jesus and asking him a question. It's very apparent this man was rich and he was of great wealth. Number two, we know the, from the story that Jesus tells that he was young. In Matthew's account, he uses the word neoniscus. Neoniscus in Greek is used to describe relatively young men. And we're talking about somewhere between 24 years of age to the age of 40. So he was very wealthy and he was very young. And uh, the third thing we can assess from the scriptures is that he was a ruler. And the Greek word there used is archon, which is generally a word that is given to administrative authority or a leader or an official. It is used in various Jewish leaders uh, to describe them in charge of synagogues and in members of the Sanhedrin. He was rich, he was uh, young, and he was in charge. And here's where so many people make a grave mistake of disassociating themselves from the story and not encrypting their own lives into the storyline because, well, I believe this story was put in the Bible because it is your story and it is my story. We may not all be rich, we may not all be young, we may not all be in certain positions of authority, but we all have a question for Jesus. We all at one point or another in our lives have come to question Jesus. Can you help me? Can you save me? Are you really real? Who are you in my life? And we all have something to bring to the table when we come to him. In our own nature, we all wonder what it is, what is the bare minimum we can do to get our foot into heaven? Or what kind of submissions do we need to make to be in compliance? And so before we become relaxed and wipe our brow and say, man, I'm so glad this is trying to hold on to me, I'd like to say we all have things we're all trying to hold on to. In this story, Jesus told, when he was talking about this man's great wealth, he was also indirectly talking to you and to me about all the things that we rely on to get us by. It may not be money for you, but perhaps there are ungodly relationships that you are holding on to to help get you by that you know are not good for you, but you still hold on to them. Perhaps there are habits in your life that you know they're not God's best for you, but that's what you use to get you by. Some kind of habit, some kind of behavior that deep in your heart you try to justify and you say what other people say so you can hold on to that habit. But in your spirit, man, that has been born again when you gave your life to God, there's a cry within the very depths of your spirit and you know in your conscience there's something wrong about when I do this. It's, 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 it's me with my riches. It's me with my certain acclaimed kind of wealth coming to Jesus and, and trying to hold on to this habit, to this way of thinking. And it's okay if you still want to just get by. A lot of us will die and we'll go to heaven and we'll look back and we'll say, I could have done things different. I'm talking to people today that want to experience victory in Christ. I'm talking to people today that are hungry for a supernatural life, a divine life. 
I'm, 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 I'm trying to talk to people today that are just tired of just barely making it and just barely going on and like spiritually living from paycheck to paycheck because they want to see the words that they read in the Bible. They want to see them come to life. We can all just make it, we can all just survive, we can all just smoke a little, drink a little, party a little, sleep around a little bit, we can all watch this a little bit and listen to this kind of music. We can all make our compromises and we can submit certain things to God like our Sundays and our service on, things are good. They're, or we'll go, to, we'll go to Uvalde on Saturday and we'll do, and all those things are good. There's nothing wrong with them. They're necessary and they're needed. But the real true victory and the liberty comes in a total surrender of who you are to God. Amen. All, I'm talking about all, not just one day of the week, I'm talking about seven days of the week. Not just 10% of your money, but I'm talking about 100% of your money and 100% of your time. That's where the real joy is in. But so many of us feel so ill-equipped to live up to that part. How can I give all? You can only do it when you tap into the spiritual aspect of your life because the old you the flesh you doesn't want to give it all it likes to hold on to all and so there's this battle that ensues within us you know uh, a part of us wants to do what's right and a part of us wants to kind of just continue to entertain ourselves and and just be just just hold on to certain things and and we don't understand that it's an abandonment of of who we think we are an abandonment of a, su a surrender of the flesh, a, 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 a letting go and a surrender to the spirit of God. Paul describes it this way. He said he was a prisoner of Christ. Have you ever thought of yourself as a prisoner of Christ? He was young and perhaps for us today that is a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of thinking we've got time. The youth in this story is a symbol to many of us that we still have time. The youth here implies a long future ahead of him. The youth here implies that he was still strong within his own strength. The youth here is a parallel for presumption. Oh, I'll get serious with God tomorrow. I'll give him all tomorrow or next week or down the road. He was a ruler that implies that he had some influence over people. He, he, his power or authority in, in his world, he ruled his sphere and, and each and every one of us today has a certain amount of influence or even authority and power we exercise in our own sphere of influence. Within your friends, within your family, at work or at school, we have this certain area of our lives that, that we rule. So I hope that today we can see that all these things, we can remain vicariously in the cast of characters here in this story. I hope that we, don't, we have not read ourselves out or written ourselves out of the picture of this young man that comes to Christ to ask him what he must do to inherit, inherit eternal life. He comes to Jesus and he asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus, the genius he is, he cleverly goes past the man's superficiality. He goes past the man's own deception and he gets straight to the heart of the matter and he begins as often as he does by establishing identity. Establishing identity. They tell, they tell Jesus, teach us how to pray and he begins by establishing identity. He asks a question here. If you don't know who you are in Christ, or if you don't know who Christ is, then we're going to have a problematic journey as Christians. He asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life, good teacher? And then as he asked him, why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. So Jesus begins the dialogue with this important question, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. So in other words, what Jesus was really saying to this man was, are you calling me God? I mean, let's get it straight here. You know who's standing, do you know who, do you really know who's standing in front of you? Once again, we see the you words and their meaning in life. Have you, you 
ever really paid close attention to the words you call God when you're praying or talking to him? Have you ever really paid close attention to the words you describe him with? The words you describe him when you're talking, not only to him, but when you're talking about him. Because if you pay attention to the words that you use to describe God, it will be a great revelation of who he is in your life. The truth is some of us don't even ever get the ball rolling when we start out to pray because we're so emotional and we're so needy and we cry and we put our emotions out there and we have so many complexities that we never really clearly establish identity. And if you run off into a prayer and you're trying to run into the throne room to get God's attention, you must address him properly. In the Old Testament, you couldn't just run up into any king. You had to address them properly. You had to have permission to even go before him. That's why in the book of Esther, we see that she thought, I'm going to go ask the king this question. And if it's okay, he may just dismiss me and may, I may get put to death because I address, address him the wrong way. In, in, in scripture, we see that you're not supposed to come before a, a, a royalty without a gift. And in Mark chapter 8, 27, Jesus was with his disciples and he asked them, who do people say that I am? And in verse 29 of Mark 8, he asked them, who do you say that I am? It's as if I were to ask you here, the people outside the door, everybody that's out there, who do they say that God is? And then I point my finger at you and say, who do you say he is? And as you're seated here from God, who do you, standing here and seated here, the same question goes out to you from God. Who do you say that I am? Who did you come to worship today? Who just a few minutes ago were you singing to today? God's asking you, am I your mother's God? The, the one that made you come to church today? The one that drug you to church and said, you better go to church today. Am I just a good idea? Am I a great life coach? Am I today the genie that you've been looking for? Am I a God? Or am I the only one true God? Who do you say that I am? I think I would venture to say that a lot of our prayers are not being answered, not because he doesn't exist, but because we're approaching him incorrectly. You reveal who he is to you by how you approach him. This is what Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you approach him in a Hebrews eleven six kind of way? Or do you approach him like that rich young ruler? Letting your wealth, letting your youth, letting your distractions life, getting, letting your emotions, letting your circumstances get on the way. How do you approach God? What a stark contrast to how the enemy approached him in the wilderness to tempt him. Hebrews tells us if you come to God, you must come to him in faith and you must know that he is and believe that he is. And we see as we're privy to being an audience, when we look back through the quarters of time we see in Matthew 4 when the enemy was tempting Jesus, he said, how do you, if you are the son of God, that's how he approached him. How do you approach God? How, how do you approach God? Do you know that he is or do you kind of sound like there's a question, there's a doubt, like the enemy in the wilderness, if you are the son of God, do this, do that. You will never ever be able to surrender to God if you do not trust him. And you will never ever be able to trust him if you do not know him. That's why our praise is so important because praise establishes identity and defines who is in our life. 
And so many times, our not so certain future keeps us from giving him the very present praise that he deserves for the victories over our problemed past. How many of you can say, amen, I've had a problem past? Amen. There's been some things back there that probably should have got me killed or locked up or in a lot of trouble, but God gave me the victory over those things. Amen. And how many of you know that we can't tell what the future is? And you turn on the news and it's very ambiguous and precarious. And you've got China talking about nuclear stuff. You've got Russia. I've never in, in, in my life ever heard so much talk about pushing buttons and annihilating people and all these threats. The problem with those threats is that even if they don't mean it, when you say something often enough, you may follow through with the action. And so if you're not paying attention to the world system and what's going on, we're not living in the greatest of times. Our economy's not that great. Our political system's not that great. And Basically, anything that you would have to depend on man for is not that great. And I'm so glad that I'm a part of the kingdom of God Amen. and that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords Amen. of this world. Their hearts are in his hand. Amen. So our future is not so certain because we worry about if we're gonna have enough money to pay gas and the bills and groceries, sometimes we keep from him a present praise that he deserves because he has saved us from a problem past, but we are distracted by an uncertain future. And we come to him ambiguously, not, not knowing really what's going to happen, not really knowing what we're gonna get. And I would like to even submit to you that sometimes when we come before God, we're riddled by our sin, we feel convicted, we feel, we feel condemned, and we let our sin affect the way we approach him. You know why God hates sin so much in your life? Oh, we act like sometimes, oh, he's a holy God and he can't stand evil. No, he's a big boy and he can take care of himself. He hates sin so much because it keeps you from approaching him. He's not scared of the stuff that's been going on from the beginning of time. And your, your, your sin doesn't scare God and your sin doesn't gross him out. It's not like you've committed something or done something that's far beyond him. No, what he doesn't like about sin is that it, it, it affects you and, it, and it, it slowly destroys you and it slowly uh, it, it separates you from his presence. And when, when even Adam uh, sinned in the garden, he came, he showed up just right on time like he always did to talk to them, but they were gone. Why were they gone? It was the same God, same place, same time. He was looking for the same two people. Something had changed in them. And it was their sin, their disobedience. Now we're talking about you receiving something according to the way you approach God. What about if you run from him or hide from him? What do you ever expect to get from him? And even at that, people, he'll still bless you. Can you say amen? Even when you hide from him, but they run from him, his love is so great for you, he'll still bless you. But think of how much more we can receive from him if we approach him as he is. And if you and I settle in our hearts what Jesus Christ really did on the cross of Calvary and how he really took care of our sin problem, we can come to him boldly before the throne. We can come boldly before the throne to him on behalf of our children, on behalf of our church, our city, and we can see mountains be removed. We can see giants coming down not based on your behavior, but based on your revelation of who he really is. That's why praise is important. You can submit to a lot of people, but you can only completely surrender to one. You will only surrender to him if you know him and you trust him. The Bible said of David, man, David's a man after my own heart. And David said this, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That was a radical statement for the times that David was living in. That Eastern mentality was that God was distant from people. 
God was higher than you and above you and you were just a measly peasant or just a person with problems and full of sin. So when David says in Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, he was revealing that he had transcended Eastern mentality. That he, he has gone to a place where few, have, few others have gone. That he had an understanding and his approach of God was that his understanding of his God was something that was uncommon. And in the text there is an original Hebrew word, just, as, just like our small word, two letter, one syllable word, my, the original word there, distinguished appropriation. From a song of information to a song of appropriation. David was not saying the Lord is a shepherd, he was saying the Lord is my shepherd. Something happens to a Christian when he comes to know the Lord as my shepherd, my savior, my redeemer. My indicates you've moved from religion to a relationship. My indicates that you've moved from what he can do to what he will do. Psalm 23 verse two says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. It's so, so very difficult and so hard for sheep to get to the point where they will lie down. Sheep do not commonly rest well. There are four criteria, four things that absolutely must be met before they will get to the point where they'll be so comfortable enough to lay down. Yet knowing how difficult it is because David himself was a shepherd for a sheep to be so comfortable to lay down, he says of his God, he says, he makes me lie down in green pasture. Because of him, because the way he is, because how much he loves me, I'm able to rest. I'm able to be comfortable. And the four things that sheep had to have in order for them to rest was number one, fear, fear freedom from fear. Sheep are so timid that one jackrabbit could start a stampede of sheep because of their mob mentality and their fear. They follow each other. They don't lead very well. They're just followers and they do what everybody else does. One little jackrabbit could create an entire stampede because of this mob mentality that the sheep have. But when sheep see danger and they hear their shepherd's voice, they are confident that he will take care of the impending danger. I don't know about you, but I get myself into situations just like a dumb sheep. I run sometimes with a mob mentality and I gotta put a pause on everything and I, and I just gotta get away and, and, I gotta, and I say, Lord, I just need to hear your voice. Because if I can hear his voice, I just feel peace. Number one, I know he's near. And, and, and if, if, if I feel like he's near, and I, because I know who he is, I know he can do anything. And, and it's not only that he's near, and it's not only that he can do anything, but I just am so convinced of how much he loves me. It's kind of when we were little, uh, you felt safe and strong. When, when your mother or your father was in the house and you couldn't do much, but you know, if mom was home or dad was home, you were safe from fear. And David says, my she he, he, he's my shepherd and he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I, I don't have to worry about the enemy. I don't have to worry about wolves. I don't have to worry about someone trying to destroy me because my shepherd is near me. Not only do sheep have to be uh, uh, totally, fear from, totally free from fear, but they have to be totally free from friction. There's a lot of rivalry amongst sheep. There's a hierarchy that exists amongst sheep. The older ones like to butt the younger ones for position, and they're always fighting. There's a lot of tension. Say amen if that sounds like your house. <laughs> There's this hierarchy that exists. There's this problem that exists. They're always trying to establish 
authority and, and position. But what the shepherd does often is he familiarizes himself with the sheep so much and he feeds them and he names them. And when he's around, they're so intrigued with his presence, they lose sight of everything else around them. They are simply calmed when they see him. They are simply calmed when they hear him. So the shepherd rivals their behavior. The shepherd, the shepherd rivals their competition and their friction and their, he rivals all that by giving them affection towards him. He conditions their behavior to become affectionate toward him so that when he's around, they're more concerned about his presence than their own. I've even seen that in the church. I've even seen that in my own life. Where we are insecure about, we're so insecure about who we are. We're, own, we're so insecure about our place and our position in the world. And then we come into the church. And whether we were in a gang or whether we came up in a troubled home, we bring our baggage and our mentality into our new life and into our new family. Now all of a sudden it's very important who people think I am. It's very, very important that people know how much of the Bible I know. Someone said, and you've heard it, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're full of knowledge and you know about the Old Testament, you know about the Revelation, you know about uh, Greek and you know Hebrew and all that, let me, let me tell you something. It really doesn't matter unless your information brings glory to God and love to others. When you're saying something and when you're, when you're telling people how much you know about a certain subject, it really doesn't matter unless it's bringing glory to God this weapon and love to others. And so I've seen the greatest weapon in the church, the greatest weapon in the church today as a pastor for pastoring over 30 years is not even really the enemy or the devil, but the insecurity and the lack of esteem that people suffer from. Well, the pastor didn't call me. The pastor doesn't come to my house. That family sits with that family. I've, want, I've been wanting that position for a long time. I didn't get my special chair. I didn't get my special parking lot. If you don't know who God is, you're in a heap of trouble. If you don't know who you are, you're in a heap of trouble. But we're so good and sophisticated, aren't we, TC? And masquerading it. And we use Christian verbiage and we use Christian words. The Lord told me this, and I had a dream about this, and all the words that God gave you, and everything you know that you heard, it's really to put other people in their place. It's really not to give God glory or to love others, but it's to show somebody, I am somebody in this church. I am somebody in the eyes of God, and I am somebody in the Christian community. So we have a lot of preachers wanting to be T.D. Jakes and, and Steve Furtick, and they do what I just did. They wear jeans and, and these kind of shoes. <laughs> which I did not do on purpose. <laughs> I had somebody call me that they, go, they said, hey, pastor, I'm over here and, and it's this convention and it looks like there's a bunch of Steve Furtick's all over the place. We pick who we like sings well and we try to sing their songs and sing like them. We pick who preaches well and we try to preach like them and be liked like them. Because a lot of people, seriously, I want to be honest with you, a lot of people are not really interested in God getting the glory as much as they are in telling their story. Because when you really surrender everything you are, you can do that because it's all about getting God the glory. But if you have a story to tell, you're going to be like sheep. Just people know walking and rivalry and hierarchy. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let people know, Joe, how bad of a job you do in the church. Because if I can let people how, know how bad of a job you're doing in church, it kind of elevates me a little bit. Kind of even might even put in people's idea in their heads, well, he should have his job. 
I'm just being real honest with you. Because we need to be healed and we need to be whole. And we need to quit having our mentality of our neglect and in our insecurities come into this kingdom of God living. So the sheep, when they hear the shepherd's voice, they're so intrigued with him that they forget about everybody else. They even forget about themselves because they're focused on his presence. The sheep can only rest if they're freed from fear. The sheep can only rest if they're freed from friction. And the sheep can only rest if they're freed from parasites and fleas. How many of you have fleas? I mean, how many of you know that (laughs) having fleas is very uncomfortable? (laughs) In order to lie down comfortably, they have to be free from fleas and ticks and parasites, especially in the summertime. They become shaky. They become restless. They shake their head and they even ram their head up against trees and they hurt themselves because the little fleas get inside their nose and the fleas get inside their ears and they start to mount up and you know how their their hair is all bushy and woolly and the insects and parasites get in there and they start and they they cannot find relief so they start bucking their head up against trees, bucking their head up against rocks because it's driving them crazy and they can even hurt themselves and bleed because of this tension, this this, uh, parasites and these fleas. So if anybody's here, you're shaky and restless, you might want to check for fleas. (laughs) Then what the shepherd does is he prevents that restlessness from parasites and fleas, clipped and oil making sure that they're clipped and groomed properly, then he pours oil on their heads. And he makes sure that it runs all over and it spills into their ears. And that oil traps the gnats and the parasites and the fleas. And Psalms said, in Psalms, David says in chapter 23, he anoints my head with oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. Finally, The fourth is sheep must be free from hunger in order to lie down. They must be free free from fear, free from friction, competition, free from parasites and fleas, and free from hunger. He makes me lie down in green pastures, has the implication that sheep country is dry and it's arid and green pastures are hard to come by. And the shepherd once again is responsible for the provision in these pastures. He he makes sure that the young ones were well fed. A good shepherd kneels down and feeds them with his own hands and he names them and he begins the process of voice recognition. This voice and this touch would be what would save them in the future in case of danger All the shepherd had to do was speak and they would come back to him. If you're going to surrender, you're going to have to trust the shepherd. You're going to have to trust that he loves you and that he is for you. You're going to have to trust that it's no longer about luck or ability. The sheep don't have to see the food. They don't have to see the water. They don't have to see weapons that are going to be used to protect them. They merely need to know that the shepherd is near. We ought to as well familiarize ourselves with the ability of the shepherd. For some of us that are troubled, you could experience, if you would just hear his voice, you could rest. You could experience David saying, the Lord is my shepherd and he causes me to lie down in green pastures. Going back to this rich young ruler, he made the mistake that so many of them made back then and we're still making today. They used God's law to try and create a new nature rather than to reveal one. His law will reveal your nature, but his presence will create a new one. And so like you and me, the rich young ruler is concerning himself with a list of do's and don'ts. He becomes obsessed with behavior and he's trying to find out what, what he can submit himself to rather than a complete surrender. 
Maybe if I go to church every Sunday, maybe if I give more money, maybe if I'm nice all the time, maybe if I quit cursing, maybe if I stop drinking, and Jesus, Lee, Jesus cleverly points out to him, it's not what you do or that you don't do that matters as much as who you are. Are you born again? Are you a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ? And he does this not by drawing attention to his religious exercises. And he does this not by drawing attention to humanitarian exercises, but he does this by drawing attention to his heart. And he says, what's that, son? What's that in your heart? What's, what, what's that that you're hiding? You're doing all these things because you can, but I'm interested in what you can't do. I'm interested in the part of you that you're hiding. I'm interested in the part of you that you're struggling with because I want to do it through you. And that's how you really can tell rules are created if you will inherit eternal life. Rules are created for safety and order, and safety and order are reserved for the mature. The pilot in the cockpit of a plane carrying over 300 passengers is paid six digits because of the maturity to observe literally hundreds of rules and laws versus a young man working at a fast food restaurant who has disproportionate amount of rules that he must observe and obey. And so we must understand that the life, the maturity, the peace, all that comes from your intimacy with God, which comes from trusting him, which comes from a surrender and not from doing as Pastor T.C. eloquently pointed out Sunday and Pastor Tim pointed out the Sunday previous about these profound verses that we're reading about in Romans that keeps pointing us to the person of Jesus Christ. Your ability to, to do more in the kingdom is directly tied into your ability to surrender. Today's society wants to abolish rules in the Ten Commandments. And I understand that. I get that because if they can do that, they do away with God's prescription and his ordinances and what he's laid out for us. But I want to tell you today that a tremendous, it's, it, it's, it's more about just submitting to the Ten Commandments and the ordinances and all that. It's about surrendering, surrendering all that you are and your whole heart. Some of us have proven we can do some of the stuff that needs to be done. But Jesus knows to look at the heart and to find the place that is hindering us, that is hurting us, that is bothering us. If he were here, he would say to me, one thing you lack, Pastor. If he were here today, he would say to you, one thing you lack. What would that thing be? What would that one thing be? You remember the little boy that surrendered the fish and the bread? He surrendered all that he had to Christ and Christ blessed it and it was multiplied. Surrender is the moment when my forces of resistance cease to function and I cannot help but respond to the call of the Spirit of God. When we submit, we give in. When we surrender, we give up. Putting the focus where it belongs, and that's on God. Jesus decided to go beyond submission to the reality of total surrender when he was facing what he faced, and he surrendered fully to the Father to put everything into his hands and he said, into my hands I commend my spirit. Let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, God, your will be done and not mine. God told Abraham he would be blessed with a son. Abraham, through self-effort, produced a son with his maidservant Ishmael. Our lives are full of Ishmaels. We have promises from God, but we fail to know and trust him and totally surrender. We try to help God out, 
with what he promised us. After Isaac was born, Abraham learned the greatest blessing was not having a son, but the greatest blessing was having a faithful God. Amen. That is your greatest blessing, and that is my greatest blessing today. My greatest, my greatest blessing today is that he is so faithful, that he is so good, that he is so merciful, that he is so gracious, that he is so kind, that he is so patient, that he is so loving, that he is so little to do with me. And the greatest things in life I'm coming to learn have very little to do with what I have to bring to the table. In fact, what I have to bring to the table many times gets in the way and becomes a distraction. Fear is a great enemy of surrender. We're afraid we won't get our own way. We're afraid we'll go unnoticed. We're afraid we'll remain unloved. We're afraid we're not going to go, we're not going to get our way and it's not going to be the way we want. Because as I said earlier, our biggest interest is telling our story and not really that God gets the glory. God's way sometimes is too long. It's too strange. It's, it's too easy for others. Others get blessed more when I do things God ways instead of me. We want mercy for ourselves, but we want judgment for others. Now I want to see the hands of parents that have children that you raised. And they kind of questioned everything you told them to do. <laughs> Anybody here have kids like that? All right. Let me see your hands if you're a parent that you just had to tell your child something and they never questioned it. And they just did it. Do we have any parents like that? I don't see no hands. Uh, okay, I see hands. Okay. Two, two kinds, same parents, two kinds of children. You tell them what to do. Well, go clean your room. Well, well, Ticha didn't clean her room. <laughs> I don't know if Ticha is a real name. But <laughs> well, go do this. Well, take out the trash before you do this. Well, why do I have to take out the trash first, you know? And they question everything. And there's other children that you just tell them and they're really not submitting to what you're asking them to do as much as they are surrendering to who you are in their life. They just trust you so much. They just love you so much that they do what you ask them to do. Do you not think our heavenly father deserves that from us? Do you not think he's been so good to us that he just has to say something and we'll do it without resisting it, without saying, I want my way and just we love him so much and we know him so well that we just obey and surrender all. This is what Titus says in chapter three, in chapter one, verse three, for we ourselves, we were once foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were serving various lusts and pleasures. We were living in malice and we had envy. We were hateful and we were hating one another. But when kindness and the love of our God toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What a powerful verse. Where do you see yourself in that verse? Do you see that your religion, your works, your knowledge, your good behavior was what, what got you to become a partaker of, of, of eternal life? Titus says, no, you used to sin, you used to lust, you used to be in, engaged with pleasures, you used to hate people. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. It was not by works or righteousness, which we have done, 
According to his mercies, he saved us. There's all kinds of different forms and methods of evangelism. And I can't say that one is better than the other. But me in particular, I've never been a, a fan of the form of evangelism that tells you you need to accept Christ because if you don't, you're going to go to hell. It's the truth, isn't it? But I've known people to do things out of fear. And just as soon as, if you wait long, oh, they'll get so tired of operating under fear, they'll abandon what they're doing. Or like we are, or some of your kids are, or like I was, you find a way to get around the fear and you create something new so you can go back to your old behavior, right? You remember when AIDS came into the picture in the 80s and the, they were so afraid that people started regulating their behavior. But thank God that, that he's given us ability to use people to create medicines and everything. And now that there's medicines that can prevent HIV transmission, now people are back to acting the way they were before. Once you get past the fear, there was a pr program in the city of San Antonio called Scared Straight. They would take juvenile delinquents, throw them in jail, and they'd have the big ones like, oh, I'm going to have you for lunch, and, you know, <laughs> I'm your mother. And they'd have these guys all tatted up, screaming at them and threatening them. And the little boys, <laughs> what, my mommy? And they, yeah, you're not so tough now, are you? And it was called Scared Straight because they got so scared in there. They're like, I'm not ever winding in, up in jail that they behaved good for like two months. <laughs> and that, remember 911? The churches were packed for two weeks. We were crying out to God. We thought somebody was taking our freedom. We were on Highway 90 in 2000, and we had uh, wall to wall. There were people standing in the back, people standing in the front, people under the altar. <laughs> There was people on the roof. Remember, TC? You liar. <laughs> they weren't on the roof. <laughs> and we said, this is awesome. Revival's coming. Third Sunday, we had the regular ones, the regular crowd. <laughs> Fear is not a good motivator. You know what has caused me to really want to serve God and to surrender everything? He's just more is his kindness and his goodness. He's just so good. <laughs> All the time, right? I used to be afraid of him as a little boy. And I used to manage my behavior based on the fear of what God would do to me. And it really worked out pretty well for my mom for many years. God sees everything, son. And if I'm not there, God's there. And I was like, oh my God, mom's not here, but God sees everything. I can't get away with this. And I learned that he does see everything. He sees when you were molested. He sees when you went into a clinic to have an abortion, you were scared to death. He sees when they pressured you into taking the drugs you really didn't want to. He sees when you got divorced. He sees when your reputation was shattered, when you went through bankruptcy, he sees everything and he sees your heart. And all he's asking is for you to see his. Because your wholeness will come from the healing that protrudes out of his heart. That's why surrender, not religious calisthenics, and let me see what I can do and how good I can behave, but bring it if it's broken. Bring it if it's shattered. Bring it if, they've, if you've given your heart to somebody and they've dropped it and it's in pieces. Surrender all. And just tell them, this is all I got. It's not much. It's broken. I even forgot what it looks like when it was all put together. And you know what? Nobody else wants it. But he does. He'll take it. He'll take your broken heart because he wants to give you his. 
He'll take your messed up mind. Messed up. I can't believe some of the things I read in the paper because we're so messed up. The other day I read, uh, I think I, yeah, I, I told a story about a kid that was, was tied up to his bed, eight years old. They found him in, in feces. And uh, he was ma- malnourished because his mom decided to go with her boyfriend rather than take care of her son. So they went to move to another apartment. And they left the little boy by himself in the old apartment. And he died. Crazy thinking. He wants your mixed up mind and your messed up mind because he wants to give you his mind, the mind of Christ. Amen. So if you stand, as you stand with me today, I would like to pose that question to you. Maybe when you came to church, you were submitted to God in, in more or one air, more than one area, many areas, but you know in your heart today that you've not been totally surrendered. That he's got part of you that you haven't released all of you. And that's my question that is posed to you today. Would you decide to surrender it all to him today? Would you decide to not hold anything back?